Ah, it's working. I mean, of course it did. This is the, the year of the, the Linux desktop after all, right? <laughs> okay, no chuckles. Yeah, this is, this is, this is serious business. Uh, so number one, uh, this may come as a surprise to you, but uh, surprise, Reddit uses Kubernetes. <laughs> so uh, number one, yeah, that's, that's happening. We haven't uh, shared a whole lot yet because we haven't felt like we've had a whole lot interesting to share as of yet. Uh, and that's changing now, so here we are. And we hope that 2018 uh, will be full of a lot more sharing as far as what we've got going on. So we'll kind of give you a peek at where we are right now. Uh, it's, we're, we still have a, lot of, a long way to go, uh, but we, we're feeling pretty good with the, the bones of the thing. Uh, and uh, yeah, so we've got a lot of ground to cover, so we'll go ahead and get started. Uh, and to begin with, we'll, we'll start with some historical context. And uh, this is, this is a, a team uh, photo back in the Reddit HQ of us uh, <laughs> back in the good old days of 2016, <laughs> 2016 uh, two years ago. Uh, and at the time, we were a much smaller organization than we are now. We're, we're still a small organization. Uh, but we had uh, under two dozen engineers, and we were still uh, top 15 in the world as far as like activity uh, you know, when you're talking about uh, websites that are <laughs> you know, busy. So we, we punched far above our weight as far as uh, uh, the size of our team and, and what we were dealing with. Uh, and on the system side, uh, as you can see here, uh, we had our single monolith and nothing else. And this, this worked well for us uh, for over a decade. And uh, <laughs> uh, a lot, lot changed with the monolith, but this is, this is pretty much how it was. Uh, now, fast forward to uh, a little bit more recently, and we have quadrupled the engineering organization in size. And uh, this is a lot, a lot has to do with the, the ambitions of the organization growing and, and the teams needed to as well. So. Uh, we, we started building out new teams, and before you know it, uh, the teams brought their various uh, services, and uh, now, now we're talking about a service-oriented architecture, and our monolith is just kind of still kind of hanging out in the middle, uh, but we don't have a lot of the tooling and the supporting uh, process uh, to manage this newly distributed thing that we're building. Uh, so, so we had some growing pains. Uh, and, and just to give you an idea where we are today, we're, we're over, over 100 engineers now. Uh, and this, this all happened within the span of you know, uh, around two years, a little less than two years. Uh, and there are far more gaudy stories of uh, rapid growth, but th this was rapid enough to cause some pains, and, and we'll kind of talk about those next. Uh, and you can kind of see, uh, we shifted from developing in a monolith to all of a sudden uh, having an SOA with, uh, you know, I think around two dozen services. Uh, so when you, when you start looking at how you develop locally and how you stage and how you, how you deploy to production, our tooling just wasn't built for this in mind. So we were put in a rough situation where we had to figure this out in a hurry. Uh, and finally, uh, inner service testing, which uh, some of you probably all, all, all made this transition yourself or in the process of making this trans transition. Well, this turned out to be very difficult as well. Uh, and then finally, uh, see, preparing services for staging and production. Uh, we, we, there was a lot of ramp up and it involved a lot of Puppet and uh, eventually Terraform uh, and Debian packages and other dragons and sharp things. and. Uh, we had to ask our, some of our other teams, who weren't necessarily infrastructure engineer uh, or, or infrastructure oriented, to do some of these things. And, and that felt pretty bad. And uh, a lot of it fell on the infrastructure team uh, or division to, uh, to do this for them. So we caused a lot of blocking. And finally, uh, we, re we really wanted to enable teams to do a lot of this uh, on their own without blocking on us. So you'll hear me talk about a, a notion of service ownership. Uh, so we embarked upon a tale of uh, you know, a research uh, expedition, and we considered everything out there. You know, you can see, uh, of course, you have Kubernetes, and some of these tools we already had in our kit, and we were looking for different ways. Maybe we can find some, something we already have, or maybe we can find something new, you know, whether it be uh, QBasic or uh, Git or Mesos or Cobol, or uh, not really those last two. <laughs> but uh, needless to say, it was comprehensive, and we, we, we did a lot of uh, discussion and uh, trying to figure out what we wanted to do. And finally, we arrived at our eventual conclusion, which was Kubernetes. And that's kind of where we, we are today. So that is the history of, uh, the very brief history of, of Reddit, uh, of Kubernetes at Reddit. So finally, where are we today? Uh, we are working on a local development story, and we're pulling a lot of inspiration from uh, things like Draft and, and things we've seen elsewhere. Uh, we have a mature uh, branch-based staging system. I'll go into more detail about that soon. And in production, we are working with early adopters uh, to on, on the first uh, major things, uh, you know, that, that, that are seeing, that, that will see user-facing traffic. And again, we'll, we'll talk about those more later. And finally, Helm drives all three of these processes, and we try to reuse as much as we can through, through the entire development cycle. 
Uh, so that's going to be key going forward. So let's talk about uh, a key piece of uh, common infrastructure here. We have, a, we have this thing, uh, we'll, we'll talk about how we build and distribute artifacts. And when we say artifacts, that can be things like uh, Docker images or Helm charts or even binaries and shared objects. Uh, it just depends on the, the, the technology being used by each of the teams. So we have this, this notion of a builder Amazon account. We're on Amazon. This is, I think this is pretty well known at this point, so no surprise there. Uh, we have a separate builder account that is the central place, uh, the default place for all tests, builds, and, uh, and, and integration tests to run. And finally, when, you, uh, when we actually build artifacts like these Docker images or, or Helm charts or uh, binaries or jars or, or whatever, <laughs> it, it go, they, they all kind of live here for distribution to our other Amazon accounts. And why we did this because uh, we, we wanted to be able to kind of control the uh, in, and, in and out flow of our, of our resources into our clusters. And uh, we we're able to uh, tightly restrict access to this repository as far as who can write to it and who can uh, administer it. Uh, on the flip side, uh, just about everybody can read from it as part of uh, just having Amazon credentials at Reddit. Uh, and, and there's nothing super sensitive in here. There aren't credentials. It's, you're just talking Docker images and, and Helm charts for the, for the sake of this conversation now. Uh, so just by virtue of being a Reddit engineer, you get your laptop day one, you open it up, You've got Amazon credentials. You can reach all of this. And this is really important for local development, which we're, we're going to talk about next. Uh, so, well, after this. <laughs> well, so as far as how this interplays with other accounts, uh, you can kind of see our builder account is over here. And we've got ECR, which is a uh, Docker image host. It's, it's very no frills, but it's, it's fast and it's reliable. We have Helm charts in S3. And uh, finally, uh, some of the other things like the, the, the jars are also in S3. Uh, and for illustration, we've got a few other accounts here, and they have Kubernetes clusters running that have permissions to reach across account boundaries and pull those images over. So this is a little bit painful to set up, but once you get it going, it's, it's, it's pretty good. And finally, we've, we, we did talk about the Reddit engineers all having read access to, to all of these uh, charts and images, so that's there as well. Uh, and they don't necessarily, they don't authenticate directly against the builder account. We have kind of, uh, there's a separate account that everybody authenticates to, and you just, I think I mentioned we were, we're reaching across account boundaries for this. So uh, now let's let's talk about what this looks like on the local development side. This is admittedly not quite fully baked just yet, and we we're we're, uh, we're doing a lot of work to uh, to figure out what this uh, what this will look like as we, as we go. But here here are some of the the highlights. Uh, it's named Kev, and this is a very thinly veiled uh, trolling uh, attempt at our uh, infrastructure director, Kevin O'Connor. Uh, and he's, he's thrilled about the name. Uh, not, not super thrilled about the name. <laughs> but how this works is it's kind of like draft where you have a CLI and you're, you're, you're basically kind of orchestrating uh, Helm and locally. And finally, and as far as, as how the Helm charts and the Docker images come into play, uh, you're, you're, all of our Helm charts are in S3 like we talked about. Uh, so none of the charts are in the project repository or the, the local directory. You're, you're pulling and using the same charts that we're using in staging and production for local development. And by extension, uh, the same holds true for, for base images and other dependent services. Uh, like if you need uh, Reddit service B, you know, like Reddit service A needs Reddit service B, you're pulling images for that that, that have already been tested, uh, likely, and uh, using those locally. And uh, I think one of the most important principles that we're sticking to is that develop developers should not need to have any background with Kubernetes to understand uh, how to use the tool. So. Uh, We'll be sharing more as this evolves. We're, like I said, we're, we're in the prototype phase right now. Uh, and we've got a long way to go with this. But I wanted to start with, I hate to start with uh, the thing that I can share the least detail about, but uh, I, I think it's important to illustrate that we're sharing these resources across uh, the, the development cycle. And now we'll talk about Helm and staging, which is probably our most uh, mature uh, thing. So we, 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 I mentioned that we went from the monolith to kind of explosion of services. Uh, it became really crucial that we could, we could test all these services against one another. So. Uh, we came up with a, with a branch-based staging system. Before I get into that, like humor me here, uh, naming things is hard, but we, we feel pretty good about this one. Uh, if, if Kev is Kubernetes plus local development, are there any guesses as far as like what we may have named something that's Kubernetes staging? Anybody? Yes. <laughs> you can tell we're, we're very serious people over here at Reddit. Uh, <laughs> as far as what, uh, what Cage does, uh, it's, it's CI-driven in that uh, the users aren't manipulating the, uh, the, the stage environments uh, uh, generally through CLIs or web UIs or anything. We, we use a lot of Git-driven flows at Reddit. Uh, so how, as far as how this works, uh, 
uh, I've, got, I've got a system I'm working on. I want to get it up in, off of my laptop onto something else into our staging cluster. I push my branch to the canonical repo, so that's not my fork. We use, we use a fork and branch uh, flow most, in most, most cases. Uh, so I'm pushing to the canonical repo. CI fires up, runs my tests, builds my images, pushes to the uh, central builder, the builder account that we've already uh, discussed. And finally, uh, it, it triggers some other things which we're going to get into here in a second. Uh, now, the cool thing that this lets us do is we can combine different branches of different services on this cluster. Like maybe we wanted to uh, have service A of, of master branch pointed at an experimental branch of a dependent service. We're able to do this really easily just by pushing branches and, and tweaking configurations. Uh, so that, that, that's been really valuable for us. Uh, and finally, we, we are, just like we talked about with our local development, we do not want to require Kubernetes experience to stage. There's a recurring theme here that you're going to see through this presentation. We don't want to require any kind of deep Kubernetes knowledge. Uh, in fact, the less, uh, the, the better. Uh, when, you, when you're talking about some of our front end teams, they just they, they want to work on their application, and we're content to like keep them focused on that. And uh, the full power of Kubernetes is there is available to them if they really get curious and they want to do some fancy things. But in general, you know, let's we'll offer an easy default path. Uh, so, how does this look like? Uh, I've got my project repository here. Here's me, this little snoo right here, you know, red eyes and the antenna. I mean, you can strike any resemblance. Uh, so, I push my branch to the canonical repo and drone, which, uh, you know, Vic, wherever you are, you're probably upset with me. Yeah, there we go. Uh, no Jenkins to be found. Uh, so, <laughs> uh, drone, drone picks up and it's, it's, it catches the, the webhook and says, oh, we've got some stuff to do. It runs our test. Uh, and then we publish uh, images to Docker, uh, to our Docker image repo, which is ECR. And if I had pushed to our separate Helm chart repository, it would have also linted and validated and pushed that to our Helm charts S3 repository. So that's kind of a different flow, but I wanted to mention it here as well. And uh, once the, the tests have passed, the images are pushed, this builder drone instance triggers a second drone instance in our staging cluster. So this is done through GitHub uh, deployment objects, or I think that's what they're called. Uh, so at this point, staging drone says, oh, you want to stage something? This is great. Here's your branch. This is the branch name. Uh, I've got your, the, your branch here checked out. I have a few config files I can look at. I'm going to use uh, the drone Helm plugin, uh, plus Helm, which is just OS execing out to, to the Helm client. And it's going to deploy everything, uh, you know, reaching til Tiller. And we have a namespace per project. And we do some things based on, uh, we, we tag and annotate based on branch name. Uh, and as, as we've, we've discussed, uh, the builder account over here, we're pulling images from our builder account. Uh, and these are the same images that we've already tested. And these are the same images that if, if, if everything checks out in, in staging, we're going to promote them to production. Uh, and you know, again, uh, Helm charts coming from S3. So these are not embedded in the project repository. These are managed separately. Uh, now, let's talk about how this looks in production. And it's actually very similar in many ways. Uh, and it's also something we're still kind of messing with. And it's not quite where we want it, but uh, we'll, we'll share what we have. Uh, so again, you're going to see the same exact flow here. It's, it's, it all starts the same. And usually, the flow is you, you do this, like we just, uh, like we, like we just saw. We, we check things over staging. And at, at that point, we're ready to deploy to production, which we'll kind of show here. So uh, we have a separate repo, and it's, uh, it's, it's, it's called Reddit Kubernetes Clusters, which is really creative, now that I'm thinking about it. You know, again, we are, we are awesome at naming things. And uh, the gist of it is there's a subdirectory per cluster. And within each subdirectory, we have something called a Helm file. And uh, raise your hand if you, how many of us know what Helm file is? OK, not very many. It is a newer project, but the idea is that you can declaratively state that I want these charts running on the cluster with these values files. And figure it out for me. Like, uh, it uses the Helm diff plugin under the hood to figure out how to reconcile the desired state uh, with the current state of the cluster. So, it's we, we we mentioned some of the Terraform Helm plugins. It's, it's a very similar idea in that you're saying I want the cluster's workload to to look like this. Make it happen for me. So, uh, basically, we we pulled things that already existed off the shelf and and used them. So, uh, I hope that this is boring in in the right kind of way. Uh, and here, here for, for illustration, here's what a Helm file actually looks like. So I'm kind of craning my head here because uh, the, the situation over here is a little weird. But uh, you can see we've got our repositories defined above. And uh, we've, we're, we're saying, you know, these are, my, these are my release names. And these are the charts for each of the releases that we want, the namespaces, and, and then the values files. And you can even see that if we want to override a specific value in addition to pointing at a values file, it's possible. So if you, know, if you wanted to cut a uh, experimental release that had a smaller replica count, you know, just stick it at the bottom here. Uh, now, how this all fits together 
we'll go back to our diagram here. I change something in this home file repository. I'm, I push, and then drone says, hey, uh, uh, you, we've got work to do, and, and it triggers this reconcil reconciliation flow. And since drone is living within the clusters, you're just mounting a service token and authenticating rather than reaching across uh, cluster boundaries, which we didn't feel comfortable doing. So that's kind of why we have multiple drone instances floating around here, and the same, same as the, uh, the case for staging. Uh, so we've already covered that. And uh, you know, we might actually be a little bit ahead of schedule. Uh, as far as uh, just kind of some closing remarks, uh, I don't want to, uh, especially as you're early on, I encourage you to be as boring as humanly possible. We pulled off as, mo as, as much of this as we could, we, we pulled off the shelf. Uh, we had it started with a pile of bash scripts that uh, did, you know, did the whole said song and dance and uh, you know, we quickly figured out that that was probably a bad idea. <laughs> and uh, fortunately, Helm, uh, Helm 2, yeah, Helm, uh, yeah, Helm 2, the, the thing that happened after Helm Classic uh, came to be and was, was far enough along to where we were able to use that. Uh, and going back to the theme of not requiring your developers to have deep uh, Kubernetes experience, uh, I encourage you to cookie cutter or template everything that you can. In our case, we, we do that with charts and, uh, and, and a few other things. So don't require people to write their own manifests uh, that, that don't know this stuff and, and shouldn't, or, or, or don't necessarily need to know it. Uh, so in our case, you ask a few questions. You run our cookie cutter. It says, well, what's the name of your service? Well, where's the service manual? And uh, is it a web service or is it a cron, uh, cron job? Or is it, is it a persistent daemon? Or what, tell me about your ports. And based on the answers to these questions, we can spit out a Helm chart that'll get you most of the way there. So maybe you're, maybe you're tweaking a few things instead of having to write all that from scratch. Uh, and, and I guess that's, that's we kind of muddled the, the second and third points there. Uh, and I guess it says you use Helm to declare your cluster's workload, but Helm in conjunction with something else, whether it be Terraform Helm or Helm file or something else. Uh, and the idea behind this is that if you do get in a situation where you need to recreate a cluster, uh, you don't want to have to figure out what all these manual changes are that people made. So in our case, we, we don't allow manual changes to the clusters. We, we do everything through the, uh, the Helm file repository that we we're talking about. So if a cluster does end up in some crazy state that we can't recover from, uh, we'll just stand it back up with Terraform and then run Helm file, and you're back in business. In theory, you know, it maybe, it maybe it doesn't end up being that easy due to other circumstances, but that's, that's, that's the idea. And, uh, and lastly, and, and perhaps most, most importantly of all, since we aren't allowing direct access to our clusters, we rely on the review process to catch uh, things before they end up in the Helm file repository, the Helm charts repository. So in all these cases, code review is very, it's essential. And it's, I would say, uh, for any serious uh, usage of, of Helm uh, and Tiller with Kubernetes in production, I think you're going to want to do this. Uh, and think about, if you use GitHub, uh, think about branch protections and how to prevent uh, mistakes from biting you without review. Can I push without reviewing, or do I, do I need at least a sign off, and uh, things like these. Uh, so yeah, uh, now, now that we've kind of gone over everything, we'll, we'll open it up to questions. There's a, there's a few links in here for, for those of you who uh, are interested. The slides will be posted, so you can actually like click these later, and you can go. Uh, if, and you know, while we're standing here waiting for the mic to go out, I'll just a little subliminal message here. <laughs> yeah, I'm, not, I'm just not going to say anything. Uh, okay, all right. <laughs> hey, so you're using a very GitOps-related approach. Where um, are you? <laughs> right here. Oh, okay, there you go. <laughs> <laughs> um, if the developers are committing all this stuff and they're committing it into Git, mm -hmm. are they worrying about secrets management? Do you guys use Vault or Kubernetes secrets? Like, how are you facilitating that kind of thing? Excellent question. So we are using Vault, and uh, for this, this may already be common knowledge, uh, but as of Vault, I believe 0.8.4, there is native Kubernetes integration, which we've been waiting for for a long time, and we're very happy uh, with it so far. Uh, but for a lot of our things that don't natively speak Vault, we use the sidecar pattern. Uh, and we, we've open sourced something called Baseplate, which we build all of our services on. So you can kind of see how this all works in there. There's a, there's a Vault fetcher. And basically, it's writing to a, uh, a file in a, in a shared volume between uh, in the pod. So uh, that's, that's how it works right now. And there's some feature flexibility, like if this ends up being, uh, if we're talking about too many, too many uh, Vault watchers over, over you know, thousands of app server pods, and we wanted to kind of bring it into Kubernetes secrets, we could. But we haven't quite hit that yet, and the concern was that uh, we wanted to preserve audit logs as far as like who was fetching the secrets. Whereas if you're fetching them and stuffing them in the, the Kubernetes cluster, uh, 
is, is a secret. You could still kind of do a manual join of like, oh, something pulled the secret, and then you could look at the audit logs, but we just didn't, uh, we, we went kind of with what we, we thought was a simpler approach for now. Got time for one more. Uh, how do you manage, you mentioned recreating clusters. Mm -hmm. um, how do you manage PVCs? Yeah, so we have a, and uh, we don't make, admittedly, we make very little use of PVCs. Uh, I'm trying to think of where we even, uh, our, our staging system needs to because, uh, like we mentioned, we have per branch uh, dependencies. Like if if your if your service needs databases and whatnot, you're going to end up with PVCs, uh, and each branch gets its own copy of the, of a database. So you're not you don't have different branches kind of messing with each other's. Uh, so we define a default storage class, and uh, this is I think we've we've got that package as a Helm chart actually. Uh, so when the cluster stood up, that's one of the first things that gets installed. We have a we have a Helm chart for a, for. A, uh, storage class that just happens to be the default. Does that answer your question? The, the, the question is uh, more the state is stored, you know, well, the cluster went down, but mm -hmm. the database has stored data. You want to launch the new one, but you want to point all okay. your things to the old PVC, not create a new one and start from blank. That's the question. I gotcha. So the answer in our case is we don't put anything stateful in production on Kubernetes. and I, I think we, we feel like it'll be at least six, another six months before we even feel comfortable, maybe. Uh, but the short answer is we don't we didn't feel comfortable with that just yet. All right, I think that's it. Okay.